I really pushed them on this one. Every time I saw them individually, when are you getting it back together? Let's be honest, if you're a fan of this band, we all did. And then this year, it finally happened. Swedish House Mafia reunited, new album Paradise again, streaming now, live shows official, Chala Weekend 1 is done by the time you're watching this. So we pulled up Batman's tech lair and talked about time. Where did it all go? And does it even matter? There's no beginning and there is no end, Sick. only until now, and Paradise again. <laughs> and this is the thing about you, I don't think you ever really gave us a time where it felt like it was time for any of it. I mean, I got obsessed, like it's over, but I don't, I don't even know if it ever was, I don't know. I, you I know something was gonna happen, right? Yeah, I kind of, well, I, I hoped it would. I mean, I banged on about it yeah. enough. I sort of felt there were times with each of you individually or together where I was, I'd walk away from our hangs and go, man, you gotta stop really pushing that Swedish house mafia reunion, bro. You're gonna piss one of them <laughs> off one day. But it has been such a fascinating story for me and for all of us as fans watching you dance around this legacy of what you create and what you do together. And so I guess to start officially, welcome back with this album, which is a triumph. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> and these shows, which are gonna be a triumph. And you know, here's to f***ing it up again. No, I'm joking, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Why not? It's a beautiful thing. It sort of brings me to the idea of timing and the way that you've been very deliberately leaning into information. And it, it, it didn't feel like one big brain dump. The whole thing felt like very, placed very carefully in order to draw us in meaningfully into this experience. But when did you start to form the, the architecture of what this would be, i.e. coming together, making music, dropping these songs, doing Coachella? Was it all sort of part of a, of a grand scheme? No, I don't say, I don't mm. think it was like a grand scheme. It's like organic, you know, how we, first of all, decided to you know, do the show at Ultra together and then do a festival tour together and then make music together and just like everything, it's all stepping stones. One thing leads to another. So if Ultra had been a disaster for one reason or another, it may have affected the, the potential to go back in and take yeah. the next step. Yeah, yeah I, I guess. So. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. we got, you know, like you were saying, a lot of people were saying, oh, when you're coming back, stop messing around, you know, come back, come back and fans, Every year, every show we did, like individually, me and Sebastian, you know, on Instagram, we're Swedish House Mafia, we're Swedish House Mafia. And it was like flattering and, you know, it didn't go away. We thought it would go away after a few years, but it just kept going. And we were like, you know, there, there might be some legs to this Swedish House Mafia thing. You know, but it's funny because I speak to a lot of artists about who are beholden to some degree to their success and what they mean to us. And it is flattering, but sometimes it can feel like it's anchoring you in one place when you, when you want to try new things. Were there ever times, and it's not like you weren't moving, I mean, you guys did things together, you also did things individually, size and everything you did, you made some incredible, expansive, progressive music, all of you. Were there times when kind of people like myself and feel free to be truthful and millions of other people on social media or otherwise saying, S you know, SHM, SHM, where it got Tyson, where it was like, guys, move on. Well, in the beginning, it was tiresome. Uh, but then, after a while, it got cute, you know. And <laughs> it then, got cute? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and then it got maybe a little bit inspiring. Yeah. And we're like, you know what, that's exciting, you know. And then we started to feel like it was exciting as well. Yeah. What about for you, Steve? Yeah, it was the same, you know. It's like you always remember that time, right? So for us, as we grew up together. We had an incredible journey you know, from, from playing little clubs with 10 people to Milton Keynes Bowl, you know, like the journey has been incredible. So it's not like you wake up one day and you're like, oh, I didn't know that happened, you know? No, but it's we woke like, up one day. It's and our it was, DNA. We woke up one day and it was over. And <laughs> yeah. I think that's what really hit people was people fell in love with the experience and you yeah. really exemplified the experience. And I think when you guys said, we're done. It felt like the party was done. Yeah. So my question is, did you feel like the party was already done? As in, could it get any bigger what you represented and your friends represented in other areas of the field? I feel like the narrative changed of our story by the end of it. Yeah. You know, I felt like it's like you're pushing someone into a corner. We didn't know what to do. Mm. 
So I feel like the narrative changed and the reasoning, like, you know, we create music because we love it and we have fun and all of a sudden, I don't think we were ready for it. You all come from the underground too. This is the other thing that yeah. people got to remember is that each of you individually were, were coming from making club records for those 10 people in the club. Yeah, 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 100%. But I don't think, to be honest, like, I don't think we were ready for the next step at the time. And I think this was the only way that outcome. Yeah, I just think that was like destiny. What are your memories of those shows that kind of drew it to a triumphant close, you know? Um, and they're different memories, right? On the one hand, you were having big shows in Milton Keynes. Yeah. Everything just felt like it was spiraling a bit out of control. Did it feel like for you guys that it was spiraling a bit out of control as well? Yeah, because like Swedish House Mafia became like this monster experience and we had to sort of feed it, you know? And like Steve said, I don't think we were ready to feed it because we had our own things also to, that we wanted to maintain. And yeah. we were not ready to just focus on Swedish House Mafia and continue to feed that monster. <laughs> Yeah, and there's the individual monsters as well. That it, look, when you're at the center of something that's as visceral and dynamic and once in a lifetime as that era that became EDM, you know, where you go from playing these underground clubs and next thing you know, you're at a speedway. There's like four, I know, right? 300,000 people. And it's yeah, just it's like, crazy. this isn't even a crowd anymore. This is just a pointless painting. Yeah. I don't even know what those people who are 200,000 people back are experiencing right now. Right? And we're gonna, we're gonna swerve into the album, there's a lot to dissect, but I'm trying to get context around that time because how does a person manage that level of attention at that pace? I mean, everything was new, Yeah. right? Every day was a new day, meaning that the obstacles that we had, things that we were challenged with, you know, going into an arena was a challenge. Like nobody wanted to put dance music anywhere. I remember when you guys put Brixton on sale, it was unheard of. Yeah, yeah. but then Madison's, you know, but Brixton was a concert yeah. hall, you know, yeah. like, but then like trying to, we always had huge ambitions and our goal was always like to push boundaries and like, how do we go from, from, from Brixton to Madison Square Garden? Yeah. Like how do we, we believed so much in ourselves that we never gave up with an idea of opening those doors for our crowd. Yeah. Put the rave in Madison Square Garden. Just the uh, conversations with them to book the arena was like a whole movie, you know, because nobody wanted to put it in, the, in the, uh, put the show on. So for us, it's like you go like step by step by step, but you have you, you, it's it's like fires you gotta put out everywhere. Um, and I think like as much as it's fun. We're just having fun, but our ambitions have always been so big. So that's the problem with ambition, though, is eventually yeah. it's going to start replacing the fun. Yes. Yeah. Right? There's only so much space for ambition and so much space that's for the fun. Monster. They need to be aligned. That's yeah. the monster. They have to be aligned, yeah. right? I feel like it was probably the least fun when the movie was kind of kicking around. Like, that movie was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I hold you in really high regard for, for releasing that film because it, it showed it warts and all what it was. Yeah. Why pretend? This is... it's. It's as fucking ludicrous as it looks at times, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mixed with genuine joy and enthusiasm. I've asked Metallica this, I'm gonna ask you this. Do you regret making that documentary? No. 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 It's a part of our history, it's a part of our emotions, it's a part of our, you know, we felt also like, why face the fans and do a lot of interviews and talk about it? Like, here it is. Mm. Here, you see for yourself, this is Swedish House Mafia, this is the life of Swedish House Mafia on tour. And there was a lot of emotions involved in the last tour, obviously. I mean, the vibe wasn't the best every day. But I mean, it's normal. When you become a family, like we become, you know, our kids hang out, our wives hang out, we hang out. We are a typical band, like the other bands, you know. It's someday you will bump hit heads, uh, yeah. and bump heads. Same with your siblings or cousins or whatever it is. Yeah, I have one more question about the dog, but you, you raise an interesting point, Seb, and I wanted to ask you, I've never asked you outright because I just wanted to hang on for dear life and hope that this, this reunion happened and we get an album and we get a tour, right? That was more important than asking the question. But I, we go back a long way and this is the time for me to ask the question. Was there a moment when it was an acrimonious end? Did it, did it come to a head at any point? I mean, I think like there was so much involved that uh, like when we that tour was heartbreaking first and foremost you remember we were talking about it during the tour like we're saying goodbye every day yeah for like the yeah. next 
five yeah. months. We're it's like, like going we'll on holiday you during your divorce. Yeah, it's but like, it's like it's a funeral. It's a funeral every day, yeah. right? So yeah. like for us, by the end of the tour, we were just like drained, uh, drained, and emotionally like, but also happy in a weird way. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah, it was it was a melancholy like vibe. But at the same time, we're like we ended it on a high note, and we were like, okay, that was it. Who goes out with a number one single and a tour like that? It's just championship, man. Championship, <laughs> shit, right? Game seven. The question I was going to ask about the dark to get back to that was one of the things I always really respected was that it showed the dark side of success, and in particular, what can happen when you're living on the other side of the day, all the time. And in order to work those hours, I got something for you. You should yeah. take this because then you're going to work and I'm going to get paid and everyone's fucking happy, you know, and that works for a while when you're young, maybe if you can handle it and your constitution is up for it and life's an experience, but it was backfiring even during the film. And I respect you for keeping that stuff in. And I think what you showed was a prelude to some of the damage that we saw tragically unfold in the years that followed. There was a lot of damage on display during that time, wasn't there? It was not all parties. Yeah. Listen, yeah. like, We've gone through like people that were supposed to be promoters weren't real promoters. Artists weren't ready to tour. Like it's been a roller coaster, but also like with anything, when something grows so fast and so big and becomes like a financial uh, engine for so many around the scene, you know, like opportunity for us. We were always like, we grew up with nothing, right? So every step in our careers, we had to fight for. And all of a sudden, like the, wor the world was open. So imagine like telling me when, uh, when I'm in my, you know, most energetic time in life to go and be able to do 250 shows. Where's the adventure? Listen, I'll ask Let for 500. Go. Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Because I'm hungry, I'm starving, yeah. right? So when you have those ambitions, like, Everything that's thrown at you, you kind of just go with the flow. And then you, we don't have any practice in like, oh, it, you know, if you, if you t t touch the candle, you're going to burn your finger. Like nobody knows, right? So we're like at the forefront just running this scene full force. Yeah. You know, so like everything that happened on the way, it was like a first experience for everything. You know, first time we had a canceled show, it was the first. First time something, you know, Whatever it was, good, bad, left, right. You're just you were like, first through the war. And they, you know what yeah. they say about first through the war, right? Bloodied and bruised. Yeah. And um, the only other person I felt who could really probably relate at that level was Tim, was Avicii. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know? Yeah. The boundaries that he pushed and broke. You know, modern Mozart, man. Yeah. And um, when, he, when he passed away, I, it resonated so deeply not just with his fans, but I think with just people. Like, wow. It was a devastating day. It, it really felt like the trade was over. You know? What are we willing to trade here to jump up and down and have an experience? Is it worth it, though? Is know? it worth it? And I feel like, you know, we luckily, like I can speak from my personal, we have each other, right? So, like, I'm not running through these walls alone. I know that, like, they have my back, right? So regardless of what it is, we can, we can just play ball and ask, and we can ask each other advice or questions, whatever it is, we have each other. And I feel like that was part of us being sane today. Yeah. You know, because like, yeah. if you would have gone through this whole thing alone, I don't know if this would be the outcome. And, and you know, and we are three, it's strong. You, know? you are friends. And that's yeah, what's yeah. like, I can, you know, if I have a problem with something, I can, I can lean on one of the guys. And mm -hmm. that's like, that's the beauty of it, right? And when you're trying to do that on your own, you, you don't have that support. And all of a sudden, it affects you and just you, you know? Which brings us to the reason why you're here, which is paradise again. But there's no paradise again without the friendship. Of course. You ain't doing it for the check. No. You know, that, there would have been times back then when one more show helped the bank balance because we're in it, why not do it? But I know for a fact that it's entirely pure this time around. Like it is about the chemistry the three of you have. So was that always kind of still there through the hiatus or did you have a coming together moment and sort of say, hey, look, you know, people want this. What do we have to do to get ourselves together before we get the music together? Yeah, that's exactly how it was. We met. We talked and then uh, Steve dropped the bomb and said, 
we have to do an album. <laughs> I freaked out because I know how hard it was to make four songs together. <laughs> so too much of a good thing. Or even a remix could took a year, you know. Yeah. So I was like, an album. I have to go home. I went home to my couch and I slept for two hours because my brain exploded, <laughs> and because uh, I couldn't really see yeah. how, you know what I mean? Like, but then we started to have the conversations and. We said like, okay, before we go into the studio and make something, we have to be aligned on what it's going to, going to be because we have three different tastes, three different ways of seeing, making music sometimes. Yeah. And, um, you know, we started to feel, you know, feel it a little bit. And then it just kind of like cracked. And we're like, wow, okay. We, we all three of us kind of like this. Is this a thing now? Okay, cool. Let's keep on, you know, and then, we felt like, like you said, like before, like, you know, there's always a little um, person here that says rave. And there's also a little person here that says radio. You know what I mean? But we just had to kill those persons and mm. be like, mm. okay. What's the, where's the instinct taking what, us? What did we like? When yeah. we, because we forgot, you know, we forgot. We've been into this storm of shows and festivals and just like back and forth you know djs especially can travel twice as much as a normal artist you know they sing their voice break they have to take five days rest we can just go on like twice a day if we want so we just had to take a breather and be like why did we even start making music in the in in, in the beginning who did we like and why did we like them and what was tickling our emotions so i kind of like all of us we just like grab the vinyl collection that Steve kept, uh, that's great. And just be like, every day, like, oh wow, sublim right. subliminal records. Okay, so, <laughs> so who was bringing in what? Let's go down the couch, because I'm, I've been collecting in quarantine. It's been one of the most fulfilling things I've done in a long time is just getting back in, literally in touch with music again. Yeah. So something about walking in the room with three or four things and say, all right, you know. The discussion was important. You know, like Seb was saying, like, we were like, I had no idea what Seb listened to in his free time. I had no idea what Axe was listening to in yeah. his free time. So I was, we were just like, you know when, you, when you're kids, right? Mm -hmm. And you just go to the vinyl store and you pick something up or you discover something. Yeah. You just want to show it to all your friends. Yeah. Regardless of what yeah. it is. And that was what it was. We were just like playing yeah. and just like, yo, check this out, check this. And it just becomes this like inspirational road. What was a wow you know? record where all three of you were like, oh sh An old record? Yeah, like one you brought Demon in. Demon versus Heartbreaker was one of them. Wow. You are my high. Yeah, yeah. It sounds, it just sounds like yeah. our youth, you know what I mean? It has melodies, it has something melancholic, but it also has something Tough. sexy yeah. and it, it's dance and it's cool. Yeah. That was something that we you're like, wow, okay, we like the aesthetics, the sonics, everything. That here. connects the three of us. What about for you, Axe? Was the one that really stood I out? I mean, it was like many different ones, but we came back a lot to um, Stuart Price's things, yeah. you know, all his remixes under different names, yeah, you yeah. know. The yeah. God, Stuart Price. Like he was on a tear, man, for yeah. a good decade, an absolute tear. It changed it all. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, so every week you guys at Radio 1 would play a new yeah. Uh, like remix Duke. of him, yeah. and we were all like, Whoa. we couldn't even keep up. No, I mean, <laughs> I couldn't even keep up with who was what. Yeah. I would come in sometimes, and I'd go and see Pete go into a studio on a, whenever, and I'd say, dude, what the fuck was that record you just played an hour ago? And he's yeah. like, you're not gonna. And that voice, you're not gonna believe it. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, that voice, it's Stuart Price. I'm like, get the f out of here. Yeah. When is this guy gonna stop? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. We've been listening to him a lot. Yeah, that era had a lot to offer. I think when dance music was cool. Regardless. Like, I remember, yeah. I actually remember we ha used to have a lot of these discussions back in the day, like, what are you crazy? This is cringe. You can't play this. Mm. You know, there was, a, there was a cool police. Yeah. Really <laughs> serious cool police. Lady, yeah. hear me that was tonight. Like, I remember hearing that just being like, ooh, is that on the line? And then I would hear yeah. that a few years later, I'd be yeah, like, what oh, the f*** was I yeah, kidding? I that is a certified smasher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> correct. No, but yeah. like, that, that period of time, Dance music was so cool, yeah. but still catchy, you yeah. know, like, yeah. and that was really something that we thought but about. I really Before it takes over, yeah. 
But yeah. I really feel when you're talking about dance music, that dance music is in a really good place right now. It feels like it kind of reset somehow. And all these young kids and all these new labels and producers and DJs doing really impressive things, like especially from UK. Two, two of the best producers making music right now are Peggy and Charlotte, who are just coming in and smashing yeah. it, you know what I mean? And so that door is so wide open now. Yeah. And, and I mean, Dawn Ricard, right? I mean, talk about making an incredible album from within the LGBTQ community in New Orleans yeah, about that, that community. That's really dope. I mean, that second line record has blew my mind as a concept and everything else. And I just feel like, yeah, it, but it's always been a magpie environment, dance music. It's always been able to draw and adapt. Yeah. And when someone does it right, you know, they become that, that benchmark again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and it's also like like you were saying, like, like the reset has been, I think it's really important for dance music, you know. For us it was, it became so big, you know. Like it became like it just tipped into like the mainstream and every festival try, it started to book. You were the biggest band in the world. I honestly yeah. think that in terms of like new band, not like U2 or yeah. Coldplay or whatever, yeah, yeah, you were yeah. the biggest band in the world. You were playing yeah. 80,000 people on your own ticket. Yeah. Not a festival. Yeah. yeah. You. Hard to kiss. <laughs> yeah. That was kind of it's like... It's nice when you say it that, like that. I remember now, at least we've been the biggest band But the, the whole thing True. back then was like, it felt like the golden ticket. We just did one event. We're like, okay, let's go to New York and do Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Every agent in the world was like, are they joking or like what do you like I remember the you market moded it as it's called Depeche moding it when you take yourself into a stadium way ahead of schedule and yeah. then after that yeah that's all but anyone wants remember? to see you and the marketing the flyer said yeah if you don't know who we are don't fucking come yeah. <laughs> that was our flyer <laughs> do you remember I mean, when, we, when we announced Milton Keynes I don't know if you remember we announced Milton Keynes Bowl and every newspaper in England had headlines what a shit show it was gonna be. They were like, they won't sell a ticket. The only people that's ever sold those tickets were Metallica. It was this crazy press about us not getting anywhere. And all of a sudden we're standing there and it's like full, you know? So I remember I, fainting on that show. That was crazy. Yeah. yeah, you did. Yeah. I faint because I was so nervous. I never seen like 60,000 people in one floor like that uh, or ground. And I remember taking the microphone and I want to say something to this wonderful kid standing there. But I didn't take a, you know, a proper breath. Yes, before. So I said something and then I didn't see anything. I mean, we had a couple of rough nights but, before. Yeah, the show I did some well. rough nights before. But yeah. our tour manager back then was such a pro because he, I don't know how, he may, might see that before coming. I said, I don't know how, but he had like oxygen, oxygen like that. So he's like, whoosh. And I was like, up again. <laughs> you know, when your tour manager's walking around with an oxygen tank with an arm's reach, yeah. you've got to make some lifestyle well, changes. We you know what I mean? Well, yeah. we didn't hate alcohol. So, I yeah. mean, we had some fun. <laughs> but also, I wonder whether or not to some degree, not to go backwards, because I like where we're going. But, you know, there's, I always think that when you get in that place where you've got a drink in your hand or something else nearby and you're climbing that ascent, it's sort of a coping mechanism. It's like, yeah. how else can I process this to some degree? Do you think looking back on it, Seb, there was an element of you just trying to kind of dull the anxiety of being where you're yeah, at? Yeah, of course, yeah. All the time. Still. Yeah, I mean, listen, remember, I remember like going like 45 shows deep on a run. Like I couldn't even leave the green room without Because a we had this thing where well, we, we actually started Swedish House Mafia and the first shows that we were booked on, we said like, can we have free drinks? They're yeah. like, sure, that was the only thing <laughs> yeah. that we wanted. Like, that we didn't pizza. really want money. Like, like if we get yeah. free drinks, we're happy. And um, well, we started to get this kind of like brand where, oh, Swedish House Mafia is coming. They will drink straight from the bottle I in the booth. I was at Future Music Festival on the same bill as you, side of stage with Rob Swire, yeah. and Gareth, Knife Party, and Scr Sonny Skrillex, you had a bar yeah. behind the DJ. Yeah, yeah. You might not know this. All you saw was the <laughs> skills <laughs> and the light show behind the DJ booth was yeah. a fully functioning bar. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy all the, all the stuff that happened and like how the scene evolved and like yeah. the, 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 just to, we spoke about that that night when we decided to come back, but just like, just the mem, I can like, I can live with the memories of our past for the rest of my life. And it's like, 
I'm, I'm happy the way it is. I know why you want to do an album, because you didn't, hadn't done one. Yeah. It's like, how do you have this legacy of what you represent and, and not have a body of work that truly represents the three of you in one session? 100%. One, you know what I mean? Like it's, That's it's, exactly how it is. Yeah. It was a challenge uh, to start making an album, but like Steve, you know, when he brought it up, like we had to make an album, I said, of course, like in the end of the day, we cannot die and not make an album. It feels weird. It was, it was a quite long journey because of, you know, COVID and, you know, some of us went away and south of Sweden and north and left and right and so on. But um, when we started making the album, we just said, okay, let's start writing music. Like, let's not, you know, think about how it will sound now. Like, let's just make chords, let's just write music, let's just go down to the dashboard and just like see what we want to say. Yeah. So we started to throw in like, you know, this inspirational mood board kind of like with music, pictures, videos, old stuff, futuristic stuff, I guess. And we just started to kind of like soundscape those pictures. Yeah. And, you know, then we, we started to kind of like realize that we're trying to recreate the paradise that we grew up in. And for us, paradise doesn't necessarily to be the apple tree with the snake and the heavens and the hells. For us, paradise is a small little club in yeah. Germany. Yeah. But paradise for us is like... Literally called paradise. It's a sonical journey. Yeah, yeah. that's what I mean. Yeah. mean like yeah. we, we had our, one of our best nights in a little club in Stockholm for 99 people or 95 or whatever it was. That was paradise for us. You know yeah. what I mean? Like when we started to talk about these memories and started to like, yeah, like I said, we just started to make music for those pictures and memories and what we saw you have one hundred look you you will play in front of t tens of thousands of people this weekend but you in my opinion have made a love letter for the club mm. yeah i mean the way it starts you've given us big bombastic smash hit songs you know <laughs> save the it's called save the fucking world you yeah, know? it's no. called save the world yeah, it's like, crazy right? we're gonna save the world one <laughs> smasher at a time you know yeah. it's like it's a big fucking statement yeah this time it's different. It takes time to heal. Yeah. Right? It takes time to heal. You've gone somewhere internal. Whereas everything just felt external, like push it out. It's this time, like you say, it, it just feels like you went in, in like inside. Yeah. We yeah, but it also did. like it it changed it like going into this period of time and coming together and and with the pandemic going on and everything that happens, like it was the first time we can sit down and think about making music that didn't have uh, purposely a set time yeah, yeah. for a show like yeah. you know otherwise like when we when we made music before we're like we let, we need to make the the song that we start the show with, well that's what the compilation know? to me was was it was a collection of songs that yeah. worked in the in the field yeah. <laughs> and now all of a sudden we're like yeah. I was driving home one night and we're like you know it should be dope to make a song for like me driving home at night and that one's called home <laughs> yeah, yeah that yeah. that was actually our kind of like I said something, I remember we talked about like during lunch, I'm like, how the f would Swedish House Mafia sound on a Sunday morning? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I actually want to make a song on it for a Sunday I morning vibe. I can love that song. Oh, and thank you. You know, what's great is that, you know, four, four songs into it, you know, we get through the first two beautiful, uplifting, energies rising, Jacob's Note, Moth to Flame, <laughs> <laughs> Mafia, <Yeah. laughs> like, turn the lights off. That shit is crazy. Like, that is like, oh, it's not going to be that album. No. So I, I really want to, at this point, talk, because we'll get back to Abel in a minute. It's important we talk about Moth to a Flame and the, this great relationship you're developing with him. But Mafia, to me, is like, that's how you know you're in trouble as a listener. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has a, you know, our idea with the song was actually like, how would it sound if we made s music for the actual drama that we've been through? So the actual demo uh, yeah. version was called Drama. It was called Drama, yeah. So yeah. we're like, how would a five minute or three minute anxiety attack a la yeah. Swedish house mafia And isn't it amazing like? how anxiety sounds so exciting? Yeah, yeah I know, right? It's crazy. Yeah. It's actually yeah, if crazy. If you're not that person with anxiety. So we just, that <laughs> no, was but actually- but then you're even more trauma to it because yeah. anxiety needs friends. That's yeah. the point. <laughs> that was actually the, the record on the album that took least time to make. 
Yeah. So we're like, we all looked at each other, but I think we know how it would sound with <laughs> some anxiety and drama. So we just went in and we just had fun. We just made a record. And that was and, a quick one. And I just felt like, cause, cause we felt like, should this have vocals or could we add something to it? I'm like, we, should, we all felt like, no, 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 we just have to it feel. It kind of does have a vocal though. That's the yeah, weird yeah, thing yeah. about it is we I actually, hear what you're we saying. We actually <laughs> doing the vocals on that record. Yeah. I am actually saying something on Swedish in the end, Eremo, <laughs> that you can't really hear because of the distortion. But um, yeah, we just wanted to, because we, 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 we thought about it, like everybody knows the Swedish House Mafia has a lot of drama internally sure. and outside and, you know, with our history of our, you know, teams that we worked with and so on. We've yeah. been messy, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so we like, let's go and make a song. So it's a self share it down. <laughs> it's basically a self portrait, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it's nicely yeah. put. Yeah. But from there, like you stay in that zone and you start moving into a different territory, which you, you've definitely already shown us with the songs that you've given us. You, you're not going to stay in a four on the floor space, but Frankenstein's a whole other thing. And I feel, you know, with ASAP on it, with ASAP Rocky on it, um, who to me is one of the few voices that can cross lanes yeah. so effortlessly yeah. Yeah. and still remain essentially the same Rocky that we all in particular, a whole generation of young kids yeah. can worship. Yeah. yeah. What is it about him? I mean, he was kind of like the first uh, guy we wanted to work with when we started the project. Because we said like, we really love Aesop Rocky, first and foremost. And like you just said, like he is just, Mr. Culture himself, you yeah, know, he, he doesn't give a f about anything. He yeah, just he makes is. what he feels. You feel that. And we felt like we want to work with him. I was, you know, we were in LA and we just felt like, let's do it. And he was up for it. And we were like, wow, does he want to work with us? Okay. Like, I guess the last thing he heard from us was, don't you worry, child. Mm. How, okay, so let's do it. And we started yeah. to make some songs. Yeah. He was actually co-wrote, co-writer on the Lifetime that we did with Shake and Ty Dolla Sign. Yeah. So we made that, we made some stuff for him. I'm not sure what happened to that, but then we started to making songs and we just felt like, you know, yeah, he came to Sweden because he had a show and you, we all know what happened in Sweden. Same and trip. Yeah, <clears throat> the day after, yeah. Oh. So, so we went into the studio and I remember one of us like, dring, dring on the piano. He's like, wait, 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 wait. what did you do? Because we have like a piano there, because the piano hits like, Wait, 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 what do you do? Like, that sounded like Frankenstein. I'm like, that's a dope name for a song. It's like, let's do it now. So we're like, drink, drink. And we started to like, and he had this guy with him, um, Kevin Crash, and he's like with him in his team, in his studio. And he started to make like drums and we started to like throw stuff at each other. And the song came about like a couple of hours. Outstanding. It, yeah, we just had a Moog synth and we started to, you know, crack. We had a lot of fun in that session. Isn't it lot. great, you know, when you meet people who were, there's a kindred creative, spirituality there and just you just all you have to do is get out of your own way yeah all you have to do is just look for the signs you know i can't believe that that all coincided with what went on there it's funny man i you know i just went home to new zealand and i saw a side of new zealand i i'd only remembered as a kid you know and it was in contrast to the new zealand that everyone thinks of it as which exists too but there's also like anywhere a conservative nature to the country that i'm from and i saw that on display and everything else and it just was like oh, okay i need to be reminded what my country my home really represents that it's never just one thing you all chose to go back home having lived abroad and done various different things. Did it surprise you the way Sweden can flip like that and be so incredibly straight when we look at the music and the art that's come out of there as being so beautifully eccentric and, and, and wide open? Sweden's a tricky place, man. Yeah. You know, like, like my memory of Sweden was much different from when I, when I spent my 10 years here. I was like, yeah, Sweden's this great place I go to in either like around Christmas or summer and yeah. everybody's friendly and it's a vibe and you like, see it at its best yeah at its best and everybody you meet kind of like oh sweden great like everything's fantastic so you kind of like yeah everything's fantastic and then i moved back started to go back and i was like there's a lot of issues here you know and once you start digging like you start realizing like what the energy is like and what what the, what the conversations are and like poverty and whatever it could be you know we had our are moments in Sweden where we actually feel like Sweden is really important to us, especially when we go back to dig deep into what we feel and what we want to make. It's important to be in the environment where we all started. Yeah. Um, 
I love making music in Los Angeles or in England or, uh, to be honest, anywhere, as long as it's good energy. But I think that in Sweden, something happens to us. We become young in a weird way. You know what I mean? Like that's true. Because yeah. we we go to our studios with our synthesizers, with our thing. There's not like five engineers or this bar that we were talking before or this, you know, runners running around. It's just us and the machines and it just takes us to good places. Sweden's a perfect place to be in a bubble. If you stack up, if, if you actually had a real Eurovision, yeah, not like a, here's this year's really on the nose pop song <laughs> versus yeah. another one, but actually, who has stacked up the most amount of sales and streams and hard tickets sold out of any of the countries, in particular in Europe? Sweden's number one. I mean, you, Abba, and Max Martin alone. Yeah. Gone, out of here. Yeah. So what is it? Like, how do you, having grown up there and then gone back with I'll tell you, we talked about this yesterday. Yeah, it's because like, Sweden is such a small country and there's like a, this spirit of success abroad that is yeah. kind of built there, you know, in, into us. Like some artists, you know, they have a big domestic market that is fine for them to, to, to work with, you yeah. know. Yeah. But, but Sweden, like with everything, with music, with entrepreneurs, everything, it's like this goal to get out, you know. Yeah. So I was thinking about what's up with Swedes and our melodies and stuff that we make. And like, it has something similar, something in the DNA. And I was thinking about it so much and I started to like Google old um, kids TV shows and movies, Swedish movies. And I realized, realized how good the music was. Wow, sinking in. So I think for me, it started right there. Yeah. So I started to check up who made all this music. And there was this guy, I can't pronounce his surname. I think it's called Gustav Alexander, but he was actually from, Budapest, so he wasn't even from Sweden. He was, I think that he plays a huge part of That's crazy. my musical inspiration because I remember these songs, because I remember watching those TV shows when I was a kid and it touched me. Yeah. If you watch some other TV shows from, you know, it's like ding, da, ding, da, ding, ding, yeah. like, but this was like proper melancholic, beautiful melodies, strings, piano, and it touched me when I was like three to eight years old. I think, um, so I think that but, I have a lot to thank You know, him. let's not forget like the past in Sweden. We had a really dark Viking era. Yeah. So like, it's a pretty dark, like all <laughs> Nordics are super dark. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I think right. when I first sort of got to know you, once you'd started to release music of Swedish House Mafia, there was this idea that there'd be this Euro you know, very sort of wide open European charm or whatever. And then I realized really quickly that, oh no, you got to get to know the Swedes. Like you can't, yeah. they're not just going to be like, hey, come on in. Like, how do I put this? I'm just going to hit it on the nose. There was always a bit of a darkness to the way that, that the energy that surrounded, the music was so up, but you guys moved with a darkness to it. Like not in a negative, awful way, just like yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Like. There's a hardness to it, right? Yeah, yeah but I think and that's, that's what yeah. the song Mafia comes from, that, that yeah. energy that you're talking about. But I also that think it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, growing up, Sweden's like, it's a tough place, right? So like everybody's super like protective of theirs. It's like, you know, I, I, I could live next to a neighbor of my whole life. I'd never said hi to him, you know, like it's like super personal and private. And for us, like growing up there, but like also being like, expressive and making music and and just coming out to the world like Axe was saying earlier like growing up in Sweden we never had anything there we always had to aim out you know like our we our biggest dream was that our vinyl was going to be played in Ibiza by a DJ mm -hmm. when we were 15 16 yeah. that was the biggest goal we had whereas like if I would have grown up in LA maybe my biggest goal would be a uh, LA radio station you know? I mean, you grew up in so, Auckland, dude. All you want to do is play Sydney. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, that's still three hours flying time away. So I can totally relate to that. But what also tends to come with a small environment is that all of that ambition has to have a counterpoint. Yeah. And in New Zealand, that counterpoint is called tall poppy syndrome, which is that no one will ever be harder on you than the people who live next door to you. Is that the case in Sweden as well? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's called Jantelagen. Yeah. It right. has a Swedish expression. <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we've never heard another expression like this. Like poppy, right? Chop yeah. it down. Yeah. yeah, chop it down. Don't think that you're better than anybody yeah. else. 
Yeah. And yet you chose to go home. Yeah. And yeah, but you have this love-hate relationship, yeah. right? Whereas like when we grew up, we never had support from Sweden. We made it abroad yeah. to come home and play a stadium and call it quits. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, like you never have people backing you up. And then all Still of a Vikings, sudden, man. What can I bring home? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go hit the seas yeah, and whatever I catch, I'll bring it home. You bring go out home. and raid and you come home. Yeah. You know? <laughs> wow, that's why. <laughs> I think we've achieved something that's here. That's deep. I think we've that's achieved deep. something here. You know? Wow, that's mind-blowing. I've always wondered why. Yeah. Wow. The coin just fell down. Yeah. The, the whole <laughs> Viking <laughs> legacy is... The Viking thing, yeah. Yeah, man. What are you going to go and gather? What, and, you know, well, we're now on, an, on another gathering hunt, so... You are. You know, you are. So we, and, we um, might have to <laughs> go home soon again then. Well, but it's different this time, right? Because that's one of the beautiful things about maturity. Yeah. Is it affords you perspective and a chance to see what's really important. And you've all developed families and things that ultimately will be there for you whether you're sitting here or up there or mm. not. Yeah. Right? Which makes this even more precious, does it not? Yeah. You're absolutely right. The beauty of being more mature is that you can say no more and it's okay. Like you said before, when you were younger, you're like, yeah, let's make 25 more shows. Yeah, okay, okay, let's do that. Oh, yes, an after party. Okay, let's go play that. But now it's like, it's coming down to the essential. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Yeah. What do we want to do? Why do we do it? Why are we away from our children? Yeah, we have to do what we like to do. And, you know, it's a tough one. Are your partners though, your families, the people that are closest to you when you're not making music or on stage, are they, are they excited by this? Are they yes, like, yeah, of course. let's go, let's see of you course. in your element. Now they're starting yeah. to The most important thing is to have um, an artist career is that your whole family is the artist together with you. Yes. So for me, it's yes. was pretty easy, like, because my wife is a songwriter and was an artist a long time ago herself. So I invited her into my brand or our brand or my the whole yeah, artistic yeah, world. Yeah. So it's very important that it's our career, not mine. That's beautifully put. And also, even in the times when you have to go out and, and, and be at the tip of that spear, people fall in love with you because they, because they fall in love with who you are when you're at your best. Yeah. And then they get to know you at your worst and if they can still stay with you, that's called marriage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, correct. That's called a lifelong <laughs> bond, right? Yeah. But they still ultimately want you to try to get to your best because, and that, by that just means not your most successful or anything, just your happiest. Yeah. So it must be nice to see this union through the eyes of the people who love you the of most because they see how happy you of are. Of course. It's, we have a lot to thank our families, yeah. especially our wives and our kids because in the, you know, it's not only glamorous life with Swedish House Mafia or any artist's life, you know, there's a backside of it that's called the industry, the business, all of that, managers, agents, um, and they've been there, you know, when it's been tough, they've been there, you know, and rising us up and yeah. giving us good energy. But and, also, you yeah. know, it's not an on and off switch, you know, we're Swedish House Mafia 24 seven. Yeah. So it's not like, we come home and like leave the hat at the door, take off your black jacket and all of a sudden you're like not in the band. Like this is like we work 24-7. Yeah. So it's like, mm. it's not like, hey, I'm gonna go do my job and I'm back. It's, this is like, you know, why we should tip our hats. It's because they're going through that 24-7. And that's the only speed that you can operate on. Cause I do know some artists who've got to a point where they can close the door and go back to work the next day. Yeah, which is great for them. Which is you great. Awesome. I mean, yeah. but the pace today also, 2022, is insane. Yeah. You know, the pace of everything is just crazy. So, I mean, it's like you say, Steve, it's 24-7. Yeah, but also like, listen. That's the only bad thing, sorry, for no, but yeah. that's the only bad thing with living in Sweden because our team lives in LA. So when we come back from the studio midnight, yeah. Zooms, yeah. this, that. Blah, blah, blah. I know your team. <laughs> no, but we, we had a, we had a, we, you and me had a little discussion yesterday about it and we were talking about like how you're so dedicated to something and I was saying, I, my hobby is like everything we do, which is work. So that's my hobby as well. So like it's hard to like, 
like if I see a book with a nice typography, that's going to kick off something in my head. And all of a sudden I'm like, ta-da. Steve changed the chair <laughs> last yeah, night. Yeah, of course he did. For yeah. this interview, because he, he didn't like the chair I was going to sit on. And so being a creative, generous, creative spirit, opted to change the chair. <laughs> but it looks good. It looks good. Yeah. And it's comfy. Yes. Yeah. No, but what I was saying is I can watch a movie. I can't watch a movie. I got to pause if there's a light that's nice on the left. I got to take a picture of it and I'm going to start a conversation about it. So what I'm saying is I can't relax yeah. and just like disconnect from being in the band or being an artist because everything I see is affecting the way I think every single day. So I'm going to pick up on anything. So it, it, like, again, hats off to our families for, you know, being there because it's not We're hard. Not it's easy. not hard to live with guys like us, like. You know, it's not, it's but not easy. But also really fun. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but like, you know, the, the good times are amazing and the bad times are crap. So like, yeah. it's a roller coaster. It's not very normal, you know, so. The Cinebo Say songs yeah. stand out for me. Ah, oh yeah, I, why? Well, I just, I love the fact that it, it develops a soulful feel. It starts one way and where it ends up going is something very different, but it never divorces itself from where it started. Uh, nice interpretation. You know? Yeah. You constantly hint that you're going to lead it yeah. <laughs> and you never do it. Yeah. And I love that you dance close to the edge of that on that song. It, it, it just shows a real kind of like a knowing. Like we can, but we like it to be a little up at the same time yeah, yeah. Um, and also beautifully mixed and, and it leads me to a conversation about the dynamic in the studio and how you get the sound not enough conversation between yeah. us at least and what I've read about your sound yeah how you get things to sonically fit together making dance music is incredibly hard we pull yeah. our hair out it is hard I mean mixing that shit, when you're dealing so with frequencies sounds. like that yeah. and bases at the core of it all Bass is the like wild horse of all things. Yeah. So trying to like rein that in, and this is just from my experience, is a maddening experience. So it is. how was it kind of getting so many different textures and feels and BPMs and vibes on this record act? You know what, we got mad. Like that's why it's called Don't Go Mad. Like, cause it really made us crazy because of that, what you just said. Like, cause in dance music, everything has to be the loudest. All the, all the sounds have to be the loudest. <laughs> and you know, that does not work. Yeah. <laughs> and also this one is fast paced and we have, and we want full bass spectrum, which is difficult in a fast paced song. Yeah. And all the chords playing all the time and the vocal is fully on. So like all the instruments are playing the whole time. And it's difficult. And you have two songs that you're mixing at the same time, like I said. You have one that's dying to break out and be this, and yeah. this other one that's holding it back and saying, no, 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 you're still this. Yeah. No, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, like, sonically, we challenge, right? So, yeah, like, yeah. we're we still discovering stuff. Like, what happens if you connect these three things? Like, I think that the, the core of it is, yeah, we have, a, like, a, a song, but then it's like, we want every bass sound on every track to feel unique to its... So we like tweak and twist and turn and change. And yeah. it's this like evolve, like we're evolving. Like well, That's one of the most refreshing things about the record is the fact that I don't feel like you dipped into any of the Swedish House Mafia files pre-2013. No. no, but that's that's the thing. I saw this, I mean, we all feel that way. And I think that everybody can agree. And I, I saw, I mean, going back, it's kind of like whack. It's disgusting to go back. Like for an artist, it's always nice to like, you risk it all, obviously. You're like, well, we just built a fan base for 10 years and now we're going to go make some cool music. Well, that's a big of a challenge for everyone, for our fans and everything. But we've just felt like we can't just live life and not do what we actually want ourselves. Like and we... here, if the fans don't, if they don't come along on the journey, to respect us for who we are and the time we put in to do something that we it love. It was a friendship based on false chemistry. Yeah. It wasn't real. Yeah. I mean, we just felt like, and make a, it was a crazy, like, we, like you said, we never made an album before together. And putting it together was interesting. Going back to your question about sonically, sounds and everything. There was a lot of songs that didn't come into the album. Because when you put it together, you're like, what the f this sounds like someone else. Yeah. Oh, this is crazy. Like, yeah. wow, what would you think about that? Like, they might come I out. I feel like 7.30 is only two and a half minutes long because it nearly danced its way off the track listing. Yeah. And yet yeah. it's one of my favorite moments on the record. Yeah, yeah. and I'll tell like you. Oh, Steve came story. to the studio with this new analog drum machine that yeah. has, it looks like an old 
telephone. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> and it's like, check this out. And he loves to distort shit. That's his favorite thing. Every time in the studio, like, give me the yeah. and everybody like, yeah. So he started to play around with the drum machine and put a kick drum and started to like around. I'm like, listen, I like what it is now. Like, don't touch it. Leave it like that. And the same time that he pressed bounce, it was And I think we actually, we, <laughs> I think we actually threw the arrangement after. Yeah. Because we like, never thought we were going to use it. Yeah. That's the only record on the album that we didn't really mix. We're like, it sounds great. Like, Which is funny because as soon as it started for me and then it ended, I was like, yes. I was like, <laughs> you gave me just enough for me to want to double that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the space we're in now, it's like we have this, um, you know, uh, body of work and a lot of like sonic journeys that we can like, you know, end up like taking, making a left or a right. Yeah. Going out on this tour. It's like a whole new sonical experience because we can take it anywhere. Well, I wondered, and I don't mean to be cheeky, but I wondered why in your festival slide there wasn't, and maybe you will, more of an emphasis on the new record because you've had this time away and also we've all been away. So much as we love those songs, they're not going anywhere. No, they're still here, right? But I mean, yeah. like, the, the stuff on the new album, which is just clawing, if it's a treasure chest of music that has dying to get out and f*** up people, this thing is bouncing around the room yeah. trying to get yeah. out. <laughs> Like that's it's the like, tour. It's that's like a haunted tour. house of music right now, that thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's the tour, you know? That's it. Get, it. It all ties together. The writing you talked about at the beginning, the inspiration, the experience of making this music, the courage to go and try new things, and the ability now to be able to refine your sound better than you've ever, found, ever been able to do that, means that you're so equipped now to go and become a production house for anyone you want to go and produce. I really feel that more than ever before, you can do, you turn your hand to any genre now. And you've shown that to some degree already. Your work with The Weeknd is weekend music. Yeah. It never felt like the song that he does with you is yours, but his song is his. Yeah. That was a really, I mean, that was, there's skill involved in doing that. How was that experience working with Abel, who's a private guy in the studio and chooses his collaborators I mean, carefully? He's just phenomenal, you know, he's, his voice, his artistic thinking about music, he's really, really zoned in to his music. Yeah. And we met in LA, we had a great night together. We went to the studio, we just listened to music. He played his music, we played our music. We had a laugh, we had some drinks, good times. Yeah. Cause the energy has to be there, you know, when you make music, cause he's such a Titan, you know, he just had to feel it obviously. And uh, then the day after, there was no studio session the day after, we were all kind of like hung over, but, uh, the day after that, yeah, he came to the studio and he started listening to some of your, our ideas, really early ideas, and he just liked that chord progression that that we have made. Yeah, and he started to make this make these melodies in the room, and I was like, wow. Yeah, that was a surreal moment. Like go into the room now and record. It's like I just need to figure out the lyric, and he just took out his phone and just looked at some text messages and like, I got it. And he just sang the song in almost one take. One and take, I was yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, one take, like the song was one just take. Just tapped in, eh? When people get to that point where yeah, it's life and art are not separate. It's like watching something, that's the magic that yeah, you magic. experience. Well, it's actually like the human potential on display. Yeah, and it's very few that can, it's very few that has that expression, right? So labels like, Perfect for that. And for us, sonically, Abel's lyrics and voice and melody structure is like heaven for us. Yeah. So I think about a song like For You. Yeah. Ending the record, again, showing a different feeling and a, and a resonance to what has come before it. And I, I just feel it's, it's connected to what we're talking about right now, that it shows that like anything's possible for us now. Was that deliberate? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we just wanted to like, if we would put out one-offs, like we would have, you said it best yesterday, we would check everything had yeah. to fit into one song. Yeah, one right? song has to contain everything. Mm. If it's a one-off, yeah. because it's like, when you do make an album like this, it's like you surrender to the piece. And the vision about For You, was that we wanted to make the last song for our fans, obviously. And we had this idea that we want to make a song with 20 different vocalists that makes one vocal that makes sense for all, for you. 
and uh, so it's kind of like oh, it took it took a long time but <laughs> yeah. it sounds li really like like one vocal but it's actually a lot of different personalities wow. and every every word is from a different wow that's crazy yeah, yeah. and from different times also <laughs> different recordings yeah, and diff uh, yeah. throughout the uh, throughout <laughs> the history yeah Paradise again relates to you wanting to capture that feeling that you that you felt when music became your north star yeah. in those clubs in those moments when those DJs who are not where you stand today were the most important thing to you in your yeah. lives. They were your heroes, yeah. right? Yeah. On the shoulders of giants as they say. What is that for kids that don't know that are going to go out and see you perform clubs will hopefully open things will start to regenerate. What do you want that experience to be for this younger generation? What do you hope comes along for the ride? I feel like a new chapter is important. I feel like a feeling, I, I don't think we should like put things in folders, right? I feel like an open mind, an uh, open heart. I want an experience to contain so many more things than just like, go to the club, get pissed and you bounce, you know? I, I, I want like, that's why we were talking earlier about like the dance music thing that's happening now. It's like the underground techno stuff that's blowing up and kids are starting to like listen to that. They like, they don't start at the top anymore. They start digging deep. They start under mm. and they start climbing their way, you know? But back in the day it was always like you started at the top and then you start digging into the genre. Yeah, you listen to the smashes. You know what I mean? And then you start radio like, oh, well, I yeah, like yeah. punk. And then all of a sudden yeah, yeah. you like fall down. There's so much music out there right now that's so inspirational. It's crazy. Yeah. There's like 12 year old kids making music on their iPads that blows me away. You know what I mean? It's, it's like from that to, you know, the UK scene. I just right think now, it's, it's a it's whole new chapter in life and yeah. in, in society. And like, it's like a whole musical revolution going on. And we're spectators of this whole musical sonic world that's building around us. But equally, are you ready to accept your place in the pantheon of what Swedish House Mafia represents? Like you say you're a spectator and it's beautiful because I know you're still deep in the culture and searching for inspiration yeah. and respect the new guard. But have you finally come to terms with what, are you at peace with what Swedish House Mafia is? Because I feel like to some degree, you all walked away from it because you didn't know. Yeah. Exactly. We didn't really have a narrative before. You know what I mean? Like when we did Swedish House Mafia before, it kind of like, I understood afterwards what actually happened. I'm like, okay, people like loud music with electronic sounds and our <laughs> melody sick. Let's go there and shake what's up. You know what I mean? But this time we actually felt like, okay, we have a narrative, we have experience. And that's also bad sometimes to have too much experience. You know what I mean? Like, okay, sh uh, but it's, um, yeah, I think that this, this journey that we started now, this new era with Swedish House Mafia right now, we actually know this time what we want to do. And do you we... know? Yeah, I think that, you know, like Seb said, we didn't know, you know, and we just, we, it just happened. And, and uh, this time around, it's more of a choice, you know? Yeah. We, we just went with it the second time. This time it had to be an active choice to be Swedish House Mafia again. Mm. Touring, more music. You talk about these other songs that were too weird, didn't make Paradise again, you got things, always recording, always making things. There's always surprises. Always surprises. You know how it works. You know, it's like tours coming up. You know, we, we I think we're like, we, we're just in the peak of making music by yeah. the end of it. Yeah, you're right. I you mean, know? We, we were hunting down some of the guys on the album that helped us out in making this, this album. And we started to work with this guy called Fred again, that actually Steve sent me his song like a year ago or something, two years, I don't remember. But I was like, who is this guy? This is amazing. Like he makes music on the streets and like recording people. I'm like, wow, this is yeah, so- Yeah, he, he produces Ed Sheeran, bro. I think people- Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I, I knew about Fred, <laughs> yeah. but I didn't know that Fred yeah. and Fred again. Yeah. It's so genius yeah. that he, how he played yeah. that thing. But so we reached out to him and we're like, let's, let's go. Let's have, the, he's like, yeah, you know, guys, I like you. I love your stuff, but you know, how would, you know, cause he's also, been listening to maybe Don't You Worry Child, don't know yeah. what we sonically are in our journey. But then he took a plane to Sweden and we spent 
three days with him in the studio and it was really, really inspirational. God, that guy is crazy. That. I love that, you know, you're coming back with all of these miles and these numbers and these tickets and this, this, this audience and you still got to sit in a room. And I love this and say to a young cat, we're not the Don't You Worry Child Band. Like, don't get it twisted. Yeah. That, that's what a hit yeah. can do for you, right? It can, yeah. it can tee up a, an appropriate res response mechanism for yeah. people. I mean, we're not ashamed about Don't You Worry Child. We love this song. Not. It's a beautiful still, song. But, but it's still, I know what you mean. It's like, it was just... You're too big. Accident. You're too big. It's like, well, what do I do with you? You're yeah. so big. Like, how do I fit into this? Yeah, I know him. I know that's what he's thinking. That, that's exactly what he said. Yeah. It's like, I can't, like... I don't know because I play for like 250 people in the yeah. club in Manchester and you just made a song with The Weeknd. I'm not like, how do we, but he came to Sweden. That was Steve dope. was cooking for three days. That was and we dope, were yeah. like, we did some crazy. He also had this amazing way of working that he had. He's like, okay guys, I'm not sure if you're going to be stressed out about this, but I have a timer. So I make a song in 35 minutes. So it needs to be finished recorded and bounced. Which one of you was most excited by that? I mean, I guess it was me because I, you know. Which one of you was we were, most think terrified we were, by that? I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> the old seeing eye of yeah. is like, it's not how I Axe roll, was bro. like, what do you mean? Like, I can't even make coffee in 35 minutes. No, I would be like one kick drum, dish, 35 minutes, you know? <laughs> no, but it was cool. Like, yeah, it, it was, was fun. We it just, was fun. He everybody just, just connected. Yeah. Like, we were playing so loud. Yeah. And like banging it out. And like we made some really incredible Yeah, we stuff. made like six songs yeah. in two days. And seriously, like one made the album, obviously. One of the last was called Calling On. Mm -hmm. and, Love that. And, um, and then one is coming out for him. He's making a... It's a, sick. Yeah, that one yeah, is crazy, sick. actually. That's a Fred Again single featuring us. That's going to yeah, come out. I don't know yet, but, you know, we, we're kind of like finishing it today. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we made some interesting music because, you know, we kind of like... He comes from his thing and we come from our thing, but we kind of met in this island that we created and this type of songs doesn't sound like any, yeah. any of it's us, like but when you created this thing. Well, that's thing. why, you know, Swedish House Mafia, man. I mean, Beastie Boys were still the Beastie Boys when they weren't boys anymore. And I, and I still think you're Swedish House Mafia when you won't be making house records. Yeah. And, I, and it, it's where it begins. Yeah. It's, it's, it's at the center of who you are and what we it's love about you. It's the DNA. It's the DNA, yeah. But house music has always been searching for new places and new things to go, new places to go. I mean, Channel Trez is a house artist to me, but he's also a you know, Los Angeles guy making rap records, you yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, that's what excites me most about it. Um, it was a, a wonderful and rewarding experience for me. I'm sure it will be for fans all over the world and new fans too, when you press play on this record and you realize that you, know, you guys are engaged. I think more than yeah. anything, we knew you might tour again. Money's great. Money's great, but it needed we'll to be. We'll probably spend it all on this. You know what? You'll spend <laughs> yeah. it, but yeah. but what you'll never ever be able to get rid of is the body of work. No, that's, that's for life. That's for life. Yeah, that's for life. That's why you do it. Yeah, right? and that's like that's it. 